how's everyone doing? Thanks for tuning in to leaders, followers, and everything in between. Today, I have some very, very special, special, special people. I'm a little bit teeny incy bitsy biased because they are my favorite sports host in the entire state. No, I lied. In the entire world. No, I lied. <laughs> no, in the entire universe. I think that's about right. So today, we're going to be talking about sports. And um, as I was talking to Zazlo earlier, um, sports plays a major role, not just in our lives here in the United States, but globally. Since the beginning of time, human beings have been taking little objects, turning them into little circles or little balls and creating sport, creating some sort of social uh, interaction. So sports is very, very important because we get our, um, we get our, training from like four major places. Let me grab something really quick. We get our training from four major places. I was telling Zazzle about this earlier. So those uh, four places is number one, our homes through like our grandparents, our parents and our siblings. Two is our religious institutions, our churches, our mosques, our synagogues. Four is like the military or schooling. And uh, fourth is sports, right? So here's the deal. Like about a third of homes right now, or about 15 million kids are being raised by single parents. So that means a lot of times young people, they, don't, they may not have the luxury of, of being involved in sports, whether they just don't have the time, don't have the resources, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to our religious institutions, um, the Aspen Institute tells us that less than 20% of people in America are involved in religious institutions. So that is a pretty big deal. When it comes to the military, our military has been reduced to the same size as it was back in World War II. So that's about, so about 80% of people that apply to even join the military are turned down. Now, when it comes to sports, I find that's a big area that we can, we can actually capitalize on because 55% of everyone that attends high school in America plays some sort of competitive sports. So it's a big deal. So we have two people here that have dedicated their lives to not just being experts at sports, but knowing about sports and helping us people that enjoy sports get a chance to enjoy life. So please welcome Zazlo and Amber. How are you guys doing today? Good, how you, how you doing? We, uh, we both appreciate you having us. Thank you so much. You, uh, you had a lot of nice things to say about us. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's great to be here. It's from, it's from the bottom of my heart. It's been a long time since I followed you guys and. I'm very proud of what you guys uh, were able to do with your careers. So the first question I have for you is, like, what got you into this profession? What got you into it? We'll start with the uh, ladies first. Uh, what got you into this, uh, Amber? Uh, for me, you know, growing up, I was a huge sports fan. I am unusual in the sense that I did not play sports growing up, uh, but I still felt very much part of sports because – of uh, the experience of watching sports with my dad and my big brother, who I was really close with. And that was a huge part of our bond, was watching particularly college football together every single Saturday. We, I come from a long line of Gators, uh, so we were diehard Gators fans. And my Gators. dad, yeah, and my dad, I grew up uh, just a couple hours away from Gainesville, and so I actually went to most of the home games growing up for, for the Gators football team. So it was just a huge part of my youth. And because of that, at a pretty young age, I decided that I wanted my career to be in sports and I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And to me, when I was 12 years old, what that meant was the Jill Arrington's and Melissa Starks of the world who were doing sidelines at the time. That's really at that point where you saw women mostly getting opportunities in sports. And so I thought that that's what I wanted to do. And I went after it my whole life and I majored in journalism, broadcasting, journalism, telecommunications, uh, journalism in college. And I set out to have a career in originally television and then it led me to a career in sports radio. So for me, I discovered as I got older that sidelines probably was not the most fitting position for my personality and I was probably far more suited for sports radio and I developed a really strong affection for sports radio as an adult that I didn't necessarily have growing up but I always wanted to be in sports that's awesome that's awesome and I must say you, you have a face 
for television. Right, right <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it's better than having a face for radio. So I yeah, do appreciate yeah. that. I've been told plenty of times that I have a face for radio. I don't know if that's a compliment or a diss, but neither here nor there. Ja, uh, Zaslo, how about yourself? Yeah, I uh, sports ruled my entire childhood. I, I played a lot of sports. I was a very athletic kid. And between, uh, between baseball, I played Little League Baseball and then eventually uh, focused all my time on basketball. So I played a lot of baseball growing up, played a lot of basketball. And then it got to a point where, you know, all right, you know, you're pretty good right now, but you're not growing anymore. So this isn't going to take you much further after high school. And I, I was literally the kid who – you know, when I was eight or nine years old, where I would be watching the football game in my parents' bedroom, and I would turn the sound off, and I took out a tape recorder, and I recorded myself at a young age calling the game and doing play-by-play oh -play play of the game. I was wow. that kid doing that. So uh, I always wanted to do sports broadcasting, and then it got to a point where, all right, I'm, you know, the athletics are only going to take me so far. So let's focus on that part now, which I've always loved. And I listened to a lot of sports radio growing up uh, all, you know, down here between Hank Goldberg and Jim Mandich. And, uh, and as far as national goes, uh, I loved listening to Jim Rome as well, who was super innovative back then. We're talking 25 years ago. Yeah, and so, you know, these, these radio hosts were influential on me and that's something that I was interested in doing. So I majored in it in school in communications. Um, yeah. And, and I got was a little it, bit lucky. Harder? Was it harder than you, than you thought it was going to be? Uh, no, the hard part was the hard part is getting a little bit lucky and finding that in like where is the break you know there's a lot of talented people out there who don't get that break I think Amber's a good example of that Amber's super talented and it took her until really you know uh into her early 30s to get that big break you know being our show and like she got lucky in that regard that my former host, you know, found another job and we all of a sudden had an opening and on, you know, on the periphery, you know, I kind of knew who she was and she knew who I was. And so that landed her a break and my lucky break came where I was doing an internship right after school, right after I graduated from University of Florida. And the internship was at NBC six down here. The television station Joe Rose it was the sport the lead sports anchor and at the time Joe Rose was leaving his morning show at 560 WQAM for a new startup radio station 790 the ticket so I happened to be in the right place at the right time where all right this guy seems to like me and there's a radio station that's starting up and is hiring people to do grunt work and uh yeah, and so I, I got the job there. So there's a lot of right place, right time. That I think is the hardest part is yeah. is finding where, you know, kind of your kind of the stars align. Was it was it hard was it harder for you? I know Amber, you said it was in your early thirties that you got into the business. Was it harder than you had anticipated? Well, I got into the business in television and uh, doing on-camera work straight out of college. And, you know, in, in college, I, I, like I said, I had majored in it. So in college, coming out of college, I spent a year at the local station in Gainesville working, interning in their sports department. And that meant interning full-time for free um, and, you know, working side jobs on top of that, uh, waiting tables and working at ice cream stores and that kind of thing. And then my first real job was at CBS sports line at the time, which is cbsports.com. And I was their .com streaming host. And that's what brought me down to South Florida. And so I was doing all on camera stuff. And I was there for years. I was with another company called open sports, whatever. And so I'd been bouncing around doing a lot of on camera work around South Florida for many years. And during that time, I had a lot of connections. I ended up meeting a lot of people who worked at 790 and I was such a big fan myself of 790. I always tried to talk people into this idea that I wanted to do sports radio and including agents and, uh, and, and, you know, people in the sports radio business. And I had a hard time breaking into sports radio as a woman. I think that particularly when I was younger, uh, I think people just 
saw me and saw and thought she, she wants to go into TV or she should be in TV. And, and so I kept getting those on camera opportunities and it took me a decade to get an opportunity, a real opportunity in sports radio. I mean, over that 10 year span, I had done numerous appearances on 790, including even on Zaslow's show. I would wow. call in from time to time on Zaslow and Joy, but I had been in studio many years ago with Sid Rosenberg. I used to do a weekly segment with him on his show. I had done uh, a couple appearances when Stu Gatz and Hawk were hosting mornings and with Danny Cannell in the middays. And so I, I had had my opportunities at 790 over the years, but they were few and far between. And it took me a decade to get a, you know, a full-time opportunity. It's always said that it takes 20 years to be an overnight success. And, and I'm glad that you guys both talked about, Zazzo talk about you, you doing some grunt work and you interning for free and you having to do like side jobs because I feel like there's a perception that people might have like, hey, these guys are, they have the most glamorous job and they just kind of waltz right into it. But no, you had to have some sweat, some tears and blood and, and anybody seeking to accomplish anything that they actually desire in life, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to, you know, eat a, a little bit of crow. Best, best and worst part of your job, Zazlo. Uh, best part of my job is I do something fun every day. Like, I, I, I don't feel a lot of stress with my job. I know a lot of people's jobs can be stressful. I, I don't feel a lot of pressure. I feel like I get to wake up and I get to do a show with someone who I really like and I get to talk about things that I really like and just have a good time. I, I feel like it's it's one area of my life that, um, it's one it's an area of people's lives, you know, their career, which can create a ton of stress. There's a lot of things that could be stressful in your life and the career is obviously very near the top and that's not one of the stressful things in my life, okay? So I think that's probably the best thing. Uh, the worst thing about my job. What would be, Amber, what's the worst thing about our job? It's an easy one for me. The, the lack of security in our industry is easily the worst thing about our jobs. I mean, I was told... In broadcasting school at the University of Florida, I remember we had a guest speaker and he wrote 10 things that your professors aren't going to tell you that you need to know about sports broadcasting or about broadcasting. I think he was in news, but it's all the same. And he, and I remember the number one thing he wrote on the board is you will be fired. And as a 21 year old college student, I thought, huh, I'm not going to be fired. Like I have so much to offer. You know, I really believed in myself. I'm going to go be this big star. What do you mean? I'm going to be fired. And then sure enough, I'm, I absolutely 100% have been laid off and have spent years, especially when the economy crashed, where I'm on the audition circuit and I'm showing up at auditions and it's all the same girls where we're seeing each other over and over again. And you know, there's two jobs available in the entire country. And, and, I lived through that in the, you know, in the 2008s, 2009s. And, and, it, and he was, he was absolutely right that you will be fired. And unfortunately, that's still extraordinarily prevalent in our business today. There is little to no job security. It doesn't matter how good you do. I mean, that helps and you want to produce and you want to have the ratings, but things happen. Companies come in, they all of a sudden decide to get rid of an entire radio station because a new corporation comes in and buys the cluster. You know, that kind of thing happens. So it's a weird business in that regard where you don't always control your future. That's definitely the downside. And like Zaslow said, the best part of it though, is it's really fun. Wow. <laughs> it's I think that's really, a good answer. Really yeah. fun. Yeah. I think that's a good answer is, yeah, like I don't have any type of, uh, like we don't have any type of pension. Come like a lot of jobs have a great pension. You got a, right. you know, you got a security blanket at the end of the day. Like I don't like. I hope everything works out for me when I'm 65. I I don't know what I'm gonna do right now. <laughs> you know, well, so that's probably a good answer. Well, you guys, you guys, uh, cream always rises to the top because you guys do a great job. What's your what's who's been your favorite guest and why? I'm gonna start with Amber. Who's been your favorite guest and why? Oh gosh, I would need a minute to think about that one. I think I'm gonna toss this one to you, Zazzle. My favorite <laughs> guest. I mean, I know Zazzle is gonna say some wrestler. I'm sure because yeah. uh, he's some you know. Yeah, nerd. Yeah. Uh, but I will say, in fairness to Zazzle, the wrestlers are the best guests, which is funny because, of course, Zazzle, because of his affection for wrestling, which I have none, but I've gotten to know wrestlers over the years just from doing the show with Zazzle. They're the best guests. Uh, they're the best just in terms of showing personality athletes not always so much athletes are far more guarded a lot of the times athletes are scared particularly of their current athletes 
to give you anything for real or to even show themselves. It's, it's unfortunately, we kind of beat the personality out of our sports. And, and that's one thing I don't love. Um, and, and wrestlers are full of personality. <laughs> so I know that's yeah. what you're going to. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, we, we work in, in sports and I don't like talking to players on our show, you know, because normally uh, players, especially football players, Normally, players are not good guests, just not great talkers, not particularly thoughtful. And also, especially when it comes to football players, you get very canned, uh, cliche-type answers. Terrible guests, normally, uh, the professional athlete. Post-career, uh, the professional right. athlete, usually pretty good. You know, they, they're not holding back. They'll say what they feel. You know, they could, they could be good. Uh, but, yeah, professional feel, rest. Do you feel it's because they are heavily coached by their PR person at their team and they don't want to give out any secrets to the opponents or something like that? I think that they, there is no real incentive for them to be a good guest. The only thing that can come out of it for them is if they say something really interesting and then it makes headlines and everyone's talking about it and you get a negative blowback from it. They, they, they're not, the only person who's going to get something out of the really good interview is me and Amber. He, he's not really getting anything out of it. Only something bad can come out of it necessarily for him. I think it's, I think it could be the thought process. That's not necessarily true, but that could be the thought process. So yeah, athletes for the most part are terrible guests. And I love talking to the wrestlers for everything that Amber just said. They're great, great guests. Yeah. I would say the exception of that would be hockey. For example, hockey players tend to be good guests because I think hockey players tend to understand that they're more of a niche sport. So particularly in our market, yeah. They need the publicity. So they're, so they're happy to be on with you. Mm. But to yeah. Zaslow's point, you're a football player, you're a basketball player. You know, you don't, you don't stand to gain much while your career is actually happening to give the media much. And so it creates this strange relationship where the media is always there and always present and is necessary in their careers, but they also spend their entire career trying to, trying to not give you anything of substance. Wow. And then they crave that attention once they're done with their careers. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting in that regard. I'm thinking of beast modes. I'm just here so I don't get fined. Exactly. I'm just here. Yeah. And the fact <laughs> of the matter is, Marshawn Lynch uh, is a great personality. Great personality. But he he doesn't give you anything yeah. uh, because it it doesn't benefit him in in that in that spot there. So tell me about a time that you actually felt like giving up, but something just pulled you and say, you know what, I'm not giving up. I'm locked in. I'm locked in, and I'm staying. Oh man, I've I've had a couple of instances. Now that was a long time ago. Um, I've been in a pretty good spot for almost a decade now. But I I had a at least one instance, couple instances where I thought maybe I got to start thinking about something else. Um, yeah, just I, I I wasn't catching the break that I was looking for, and I I I, I wasn't making any money. And it's easy to not make any money before you're married, or even if you're married before you don't have kids, you know, you, but eventually it gets to a point where, you know, it's poop or get off the pot. And so I, yeah, I keep seeing other people who are getting, you know, good gigs and I'm, I'm not getting any of that. I'm just, I'm sitting doing evenings, 10 PM to midnight, you know, making no money. And I feel like I'm kind of getting screwed in a couple places too, as far as management is concerned. And, you know, I've, I've looked in other directions. Uh, I mean, that was a while ago. It's probably about 12, 13 years ago that I'm talking about maybe, maybe, you know, late twenties, maybe I'm 30 at the time, but I got lucky that, uh, you know, a lot of things fell into place at one time, specifically with our radio station getting the rights to the Miami Heat, which was uh, right when uh, LeBron, it was in LeBron's first year. So it was in 2010, our station got the rights to the Heat. And a lot of things fell in place for me at the right time. Wow. So, yeah, but, but I, I mean, I, I definitely had a moment, you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago where I talked to people wondering, you know, what are my options here? What about this? And yeah, it wasn't fun. You know, you know, you know what I think I'm thinking about um, Sylvester Stallone and he had an instance where he had the script for Rocky, the first Rocky movie Yeah. about to give up. And uh, he had a dog that was his favorite dog. And he, he literally had to sell his dog to make his rent. Like, almost you know it was just like a crazy story like yeah. that and somebody had offered him i think like 
150K at the time was like a million bucks in comparison for the script. But he would get 150K, but he wouldn't be able to, to act right. in the movie. It would be something right. else. And he just said no. And got the big break, got a chance to act, and the rest is history. It's Amer yeah. American folklore, right? What yeah. about you, Amber? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I tried to give up, not give up on myself. I tried to give up on the business. I, I started out my career financially pretty hot. I mean, CBS paid really well uh, for what I thought I was going to be making out of school. So in my mid-20s, I was actually doing better than I ever expected I'd be doing from a financial perspective. Not that I was crushing it, but this business normally, when you go into this business, you expect to have to, your first job, I mean, I had a girlfriend, first job, North Dakota, making $15,000 a year. Like that's the kind of thing that you're expecting. And I started out in a better spot than that. And so things were going well. And then I made the decision to leave for a startup company that was going to provide me more creative control and more opportunity. I was just trying to expand what I could do and the economy crashed. And so I got laid off. And then it was some hard years after that, where I had a really hard time getting a job. And that kind of, that ended up being a terrible decision, that decision to leave the job that I was at that was going well. And in fact, my girlfriend that I referenced who was in North Dakota, she took over my original job for me. And then today she's on MLB network and her wow. career has, you know, Who's because that? she, uh, <laughs> Lauren Shahadi and okay. she, yeah. And so it's just funny because I felt really good about where I started. And then she ended up super eclipsing me by taking my old job and then sticking <laughs> with it. And so I had made this bad decision that seemed like a good decision at the time, but you don't, you know, the economy crashes, things happen. And so I was really down on myself for a while there because it took me a while to get another gig. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go to law school though. Because I always believed in myself and I had taken the LSAT when I graduated college thinking that I might want to go to law school one day. So it was always a thing to me. I was raised by lawyers. And so I decided I'm going to cash in on that score. I'm going to go to law school. This is the universe's way of telling me that I need to be looking into something different. And then I got into law school uh, at Miami and right then I got offered a job uh, to host a television show on SNY Network in New York City. And so I deferred my acceptance. I went and hosted that show for a year. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to actually still go get my law degree, even though things were picking back up in broadcasting for me because it still felt like something I should do. And I never gave up on myself. And then I, so I came back to South Florida and I ended up hosting a TV show down here with Stu Gatz while I was in law school. So I, again, had that 790 connection since he was on the Levitard show. And that has everything to do with why I'm sitting here today. So I was able oh. to do both and I was still able to expand myself. And I never gave up on myself, but I did at point think I was going to get out of the business and go do something else. And then when that TV show ended with him, because he went to ESPN, mm -hmm. I was practicing law full time. And I thought, all right, you know what? I'm out of broadcasting for good. And then 790 came calling because Joy Taylor decided to leave. So there's been multiple points in my career where I thought about giving up, so to speak. But my calling for giving up was just to move forward with something else. And what was funny is every time I took a step forward into something else, I got called back to my original purpose, which if I don't know if I hadn't taken those steps, if I would have ended up here. You know, if I had sat there sulking for too long, not being able to get a broadcasting gig and hadn't made the decision to move forward with law school, who knows where I'd be today? Because I do think it made me much better at what I do now in sports radio, having that education as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I know you, you, you talk about that sometimes on your show. Now, I want to I do something a little fun, and then we're going uh, to round off with uh, just a, a couple of deep questions. But um, I'm so happy to have you guys here. You guys are awesome guests, by the way. So this game that we're going to play is called One and Done. So one and done means you just have to answer it by one word, okay? Yep. So, uh, so we'll just do uh, Zazzle Amber, Zazzle Amber. All right, one and done. First question. Most famous guest? Pat Riley. Amber? Oh, man, most famous guest. Um... Gosh, who's been our most famous guy? I mean, is Pat, I mean, Pat Riley, Dwayne, Dwayne Wade, Dwayne okay, Wade. Okay, okay. <laughs> There's a good one. You. Most infamous guest. One word. Oh, what's his name? Uh, Pat O'Brien. Why Pat O'Brien? 
Well, remember he had that sex scandal with oh, uh, the voicemails yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't have a good infamous guest. Um, there's got to be somebody that was embroiled in controversy after they came on our show, but I can't think of anybody, frankly. Anthony Weiner? No? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, first thing you grab in the morning, Zaz. My phone. Amber? Coffee. Biggest inspiration in life? <sighs> Biggest inspiration in life. Biggest inspiration in life. Am I a bad person that I can't think of one right off the bat, Amber? Yes. Okay, <laughs> you go. What's your biggest inspiration? My, my mom. My mom was my biggest inspiration. My mom. I don't know. I got to pass. You got to come back to me. I don't know. Okay. okay. Uh, Glenn Rice. Glenn Rice. There you Glenn go. Rice. Glenn okay, Rice. Glenn Rice. <laughs> Yay. We got one from him. Um, what's the first thing people notice about you? Lack of hair. Amber? The first thing people notice about me, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't want, I, it, uh, we're going like physical component here? No, it could be a personality thing. Or it could be. Uh, I think, I don't know, Zazzo, it's the first thing people notice about me. Uh, probably your looks. Your looks. Uh, all right. <laughs> Biggest strength. Biggest strength. Uh, I'm quick. I, I think I think fast. Amber? Um, I think my biggest strength is my intelligence. Biggest weakness? Lack of hair. <laughs> Amber? Oh, I don't have any weaknesses. No, uh, my biggest weakness is probably thinking I don't have weaknesses because I tend to uh, not always be the most self-aware. <laughs> okay. High school, terrible or awesome? Zaslow. Definitely not terrible. I mean, I would go, yeah, let's go awesome. Def I, had, I had a good high school years. Yeah, Remember? awesome. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, so awesome, but not not the peak, not the peak yeah. of life. I never wanted I high school to peak. be the peak. Yeah. I did not peak in high school, but uh, high yeah. school was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, cats or dogs? Dogs. All of the above, but I have dogs. Okay. Best adjective to describe you when you're drunk? Zazlo? Uh... <laughs> best adjective to describe me when i'm drunk flirtatious <laughs> you sure I'm always you drunk <laughs> <laughs> he probably does actually he probably does he comes out of his shell a lot more um i'm always flirtatious but uh, i'm fun i'm a fun drunk okay i'm not angry absolute biggest pet peeve zaz uh biggest pet peeve Uh, stupid people. Yeah, there's a lot of those people in this world. Uh, Amber? My biggest pet peeve is being, um, being, uh, what's the, what's the word? I'm trying to keep it to one word for you here, but uh, underestimated, being underestimated. Okay, okay. Um, biggest vice, what's your biggest vice? Mine's, I go, I'll share mine's. Mine's is sometimes I emotionally eat. So, so if I'm having a good day or even if I'm having a bad day, I'm always eating. So if I have a good day, I want to eat, bad day, I'm eating. So I'm screwed uh, both ways. <laughs> biggest vice, uh, gambling. Gambling. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, my biggest vice is coffee. Awesome. And what, let me ask you this, what role does spirituality or religion play in your life? Or, or if you're like an atheist or agnostic, nothing. Uh, it plays a small role. It's not no role, but it plays a small role. My kids, uh, I'm Jewish. My kids go to a Jewish school. My wife's principal at a Jewish school. I was bar mitzvahed. So uh, it does not rule my life at all, but uh, it's, it's certainly a presence in that fashion. So I'll go small role. Amber? Uh, it, was, it was part of my upbringing. I, I was uh, raised Methodist. I am not somebody who considers myself religious, though. So I would say as an adult, um, more spiritual, I suppose, than religious. So and usually um, I have my guests answer this question, and I've had a couple of them get emotional, but 
this is kind of morbid question. So you're at your funeral and everyone that you love is there. What do you want them to say about you? Zazlo? Uh, I want them to say that, I want them to say that I, I cared about them and that I was loyal and that I was honest and I was, uh, and I was a good friend and a good family member. Uh, those are the stuff I care about. Um, I, I lost my mom and my grandmother in the last couple of years and I was super close to them. And I said of both of them that they were the strongest women I knew and they were, and that's a trait that is very important to me to be remembered in that same way that my mom was, that she was very strong, um, independent, um, and, uh, and very intelligent. Wow. You guys gonna make me cry. Um, and uh, I, 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 I sort of uh, got a news that someone very close to me passed away today. Um, so anyways. Um, very sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry yeah, to hear that. Uh, because of COVID. Um, so um, in the end, in the end, um, what would you say your purpose in life is? Uh, I don't know that I've given much thought to that, but I would, I would say, uh, I, I would say right now, my purpose is to, uh, is to provide for my family and to be there for the three of them, for my wife and my two boys. And, uh, you know, last night after the heat game ended, I was, I was totally sad and I totally felt better. I went and I checked on both my boys who were sleeping and I felt good again. So I think, uh, yeah, I think just, you know, being there for the three of them is, is what my purpose is right now. Awesome. And you, Amber? Yeah, I think you can have different purposes at different stages of That's your life, true. right? And and ultimately, um, I don't know what the ultimate purpose is yet since I haven't lived at all and hopefully won't for a very long time. But uh, right now, it is to uh, be the best example I can be for my son. That's awesome. Well, you guys have been lovely, lovely guests. I always say it's been a plum, pleasing pleasure and a privilege to be in your presence Thank you to lovely souls for Thank you, Gibson, so sharing much. your humanity, sharing your love, sharing your advice. I know that so many people are going to be uh, very touched by your story. And, and I feel like people just hear about you guys and they see you guys uh, do your sports show. But sometimes I think what's lost is people forget that, you know, you're humans and you have a real life and you, you just, you're just, in a sense, you're, you're special, but you're also regular and you're also human and i think that's what connects us all our our, our common humanity thank you guys very much thanks a lot Gibson. Thanks so appreciate much. you thank you very much, pal. So much all right guys let's uh hopefully do this again in the future have a lovely day guys thank you thanks Take thanks bye bye thanks for listening please go to gibsonsylvester.com forward slash podcast to subscribe thank you for being a part of my listening family <laughs>